this is an instructional SOP on uh, how to use our physical vapor deposition system, the Orion. So for me, um, in my experience, it's always been easier for me to learn things uh, visually rather than just reading an SOP over and over again. So the purpose of this video is to uh, show you visually how to use the Orion, basically every little piece um, in the Orion, how to take things apart and put them back together. Uh, so this can actually serve as um, a supplement to the written SOP that I've already made. So hopefully this will be more useful to some people and give you a little bit of a, um, a visual resource on how to use this instrument since that can sometimes be the most valuable resource when you're learning new equipment. So let's get started with um, on um, what exactly is going on with the system. So uh, any physical vapor deposition system needs uh, a vacuum chamber. And uh, with the Orion, this is our main chamber where all the deposition occurs. The Orion can do two types of deposition, uh, DC sputtering and thermal evaporation. And this is where all of that takes place right here. Uh, this is uh, the pressure sensor right here. Uh, this is the lock for the top lid right here. Uh, this is the column which controls the rotation of the stage. This is the screw that pulls the stage up and down. Uh, this is the power supply for the lamps which heat the stage inside of the chamber. Uh, this right here, this is the QCM, um, actual electronics connection. And then this is the column for the QCM, which turns the QCM. So that's the main chamber. Uh, the good thing about our system is that we have a load lock which allows you to get down to uh, that pressure of six times e to the minus eight really, really quickly by uh, pumping down this smaller chamber um, very rapidly with a separate turbo and a separate mechanical pump. So uh, this is where you actually load your sample. And you can see the turbo pump back here, which uh, connects directly to this load lock, which sucks all the gas out of that. And then you can see back there the other turbo for the larger chamber. See that turbo is a lot bigger than this one since it's a lar larger chamber. And uh, here are the panels for those turbos. You can see the bigger turbo spins a lot slower and the smaller turbo turns faster. So this is the turbo for the main chamber. It's uh, labeled right here and this is the turbo for the load lock. You never have to touch these panels ever. Uh, the only point of these panels is just to check uh, what the RPMs are for the turbo. And that's it. You don't need to touch anything else. Everything else is automated. So uh, with that, uh, the rest of the uh, system is just a rack with all the electronics. Uh, these are the panels for uh, controlling. And then the rest of this is just pretty much empty space. Um, if you uh, look back here, uh, there's pretty much nothing. Let's go back there. There's pretty much, much nothing back here. And let me put this down for a second. And if you look back here, there's pretty much nothing but empty space. So the rest of the system is, uh, the, the purpose of the rest of this, um, all these pieces here is just to basically support the chamber. And then back here, you have your electronics. Uh, you have your three power supplies for your thermal evaporators, then the power supply for the main power supply, the input for the main power supply right here, and then you have the um, back of all these rest of these panels. This is the uh, sputter gun power supply right here. You can see gun one and two right here. And then since we're back here, you can see the two mechanical pumps. One mechanical pump here for the load lock, and one mechanical pump here for the actual main chamber. You can see the cooling lines from the chiller. There's a cooling line in right here and cooling line out right there. Here's the compressed air for all the pneumatics, the nitrogen gas uh, for venting, and then uh, right here is the argon line. This is the argon line for sputtering. Okay. And then you can see that both of the mechanical pumps uh, have tubes uh, that are connected to the glove box pump, uh, which goes out into the actual Uh, hood. So it goes out right here and then uh, comes out right here in the hood and just vents safely into the hood. 
So that's the back of the system. Uh, this is the front of the system where all the electronics are. So let's give a quick tour right here. You never have to worry about any of this unless it's an emergency. This is the main power. Um, this right here is the uh, main chamber pump. So if you want to vent the main chamber, you switch this switch right here, which you don't ever have to do unless you're changing targets or changing crucibles or something else has gone uh, sour inside of the instrument. Uh, this is what most people will use. This is the load lock vent. So if you want to load your sample, this is where you actually pump off and on. Or you turn the vent, uh, turn the pump off and on. And you just turn it off this way by swipping the switch down. And uh, that will vent this chamber so that you can load your sample in there. Um, this is the main power uh, for the load lock. So this turns the whole system off uh, that's connected to the load lock. You never have to switch this, which is why I taped it off, uh, but that's what that does. This is the deposition controller. So this is where you actually control um, what material you're depositing and controls the parameters for the QCM. So uh, this is where you would set, say if you wanted to deposit um, 50 nanometers of aluminum by sputtering, this is where you would enter all the information for aluminum into the QCM. This is the pneumatics control. So this controls everything that's powered by air inside of the instrument. So you see gas one, gas two, this is the gas inlets for sputtering. And then you have four uh, shutter controls right here for uh, two of the sputter guns. So each sputter gun right here, gun one and gun two, these are the controls for the, um, the, uh, the shutters on those guns. This is the substrate shutter and this is the evaporator shutter. So if I say, you look inside here, you see both guns are closed. If I push gun one, you can see that gun one opens up. And then if I press gun one again, it closes. Similarly, if I press uh, the evaporator shutter, you can see down there that the evaporator opened up to expose its crucibles. And now it closes. And this is the substrate shutter right here. And push that and then you could see the substrate shutter opening and closing so the thing you got to be careful with the sub uh, regarding the substrate shutter is that if you move the column down you can see that the column can move in uh, move in the way of the shutter so if you move it down too low this guy right here will hit it and that can actually bend the shutter and cause some damage. So this is the pneumatics control. You can also see which uh, uh, breaker is on for which uh, crucible in the thermal evaporator. You can see right now breaker number three is on. And if you look at the uh, scoreboard right here, um, pocket number three has palladium. And you go and look back at the deposition controller and the recipe that's loaded is palladium. So you can see that that's the uh, right breaker is on. And um, let me demonstrate how that changes if I change to different materials. So say if I wanted a loom, um, gold and that, um, uh, if I wanted to deposit gold, I just go to process. Turn on the evaporator power supply load that, start it, and then you see how you hear a distinct click, that's the breaker switching, and now it says EV2. That's because it switches to the second breaker with gold. And I'll show you how to change all that later. But with that said, that's what uh, this controls, the pneumatics, and it also has the, uh, the breaker control right there. And since I'm already over here, this is the evaporator power supply. So this controls all the power to the crucibles for the thermal evaporator. And then right below it is the sputter source DC power supply. And this controls all the power to both of the guns that we have. We have two guns. So this controls uh, the power to that. So if I wanted to sputter, I would turn that bad boy on. And then I would be ready to sputter. Okay, I'm now going over here. This is the uh, lamps, um, the controller for the lamps, which heat up the stage. You can see back here that there's a, uh, behind the stage there's some glass, and then you can actually see 
you can see with the laser pointer right there. There's a glass right here. Uh, that and behind it, you can see there's some there's two lamps. Those are the lamps that actually heat the stage. So this right here controls uh, the actual heating of the stage and controls those lamps. So the cool thing is you can actually heat up the stage and do uh, heated depositions, but you can also bake out the stage uh, with this uh, uh, with this feature. So that's that. And uh, that's most of the system in terms of uh, the rack and the actual chambers. Right here on the left, you have uh, the chiller, uh, which is just a, uh, a water chiller, which cools um, a variety of things on the system. Right here you see the cooling inlet and outlet for the stage. It's this black hose right here. You see a cooling line for the QCM. Um, you also have big old fat cute cooling lines for the uh, thermal evaporator. You see those skinny uh, clear tubes down there. Um, you see one right there uh, and then another one right there. Those are the cooling lines uh, for the actual thermal evaporator crucibles. And then these black ones back here, uh, those are the cooling lines for the, um, for the sputter gun. So there's a pretty extensive amount of cooling that needs to go into this system and there's safety interlocks that prevent you from actually using the system if the cooling lines um, aren't working and if the chiller isn't on. So uh, this chiller is what supplies the cold water to the system and essentially it's just a, a, a big car radiator. It sucks in air right here and then there's a series of fins that cool water as it's filtered through and pump it back into the system. And there's an inlet and outlet right here. See one of them right there and then right there and then there's a bypass hose which prevents it from uh, overloading in the system. So this bypass hose, if you get too much flow into the actual um, chiller, it'll bypass it and send it right back out again. Okay? The only thing you really know about the, uh, need to know about the chiller at this point is that this should always be uh, 24 degrees. And if the process variable matches the set variable, the measured temperature is 24 and the set variable is 24, then you're fine. That's the temperature it needs to, uh, to run at in order to keep the system cool. Also, make sure that there's uh, plenty of, uh, of uh, distilled water in there. You never use DI water. You never use DI water in this system. And the reason for that is if you have deionized water and you run it through this system and you have all these stainless steel fittings and copper fittings um, that are coming into contact with the DI water, there's a strong concentration gradient uh, for the metal to leach into the water because the water is deionized. It doesn't have any ions in it. So what that does is it actually corrodes metal. So deionized water is really, really bad for these types of systems. So you never put DI water in there. You only put distilled water. And that should work just fine. Um, the, uh, water the water content that we use for the system is 80% uh, water, 20% ethylene glycol, uh, which is the same additive that they put in antifreeze for your car. And what that does is it depresses the uh, melting point and it raises the boiling point. So it actually makes it um, harder for the liquid to freeze and harder for it to boil. So it is a more effective cooling fluid over a wider variety of temperatures. So that's the mixture that we use. 80% water, 20% ethylene glycol. And you could buy that from Sigma Aldrich. So that's the chiller. And then going over here, you have your process gases. So you have nitrogen, which is used only to vent the system. Uh, the nitrogen floods the chambers and allows it to come up to atmospheric pressure so you can put samples in. And then we have argon, which is used uh, as a sputtering gas. The uh, system uses argon uh, to ignite the plasma so that it can sputter metal. And then the third gas is compressed air, which you can see goes back here and then goes into the hood and uh, connects to the house compressed air line right here. This should always be 80 PSI and this should always be on. And the compressed air operates all of these shutters right here. 
So it makes it so that you can open and close all these shutters. Without the compressed air, none of the shutters will work. And that's a telltale sign that the compressed air isn't on. <coughs> okay. So uh, the compressed air is supposed to be at 80 PSI. In terms of the other gases, they should all be uh, between 0 and 20 PSI. And the reason for that is um, the mass flow controllers in the system aren't designed to ha handle higher than 20 PSI for uh, the argon and the nitrogen. So if you run it above that, uh, it could damage the system. So I have these set as 20 PSI. If you've ever used a regulator, this is how you set the actual uh, pressure of the downstream gas. And then this opens up the tank right here. You can see that we have an extra line with the nitrogen here. Um, and this opens it up to atmosphere. And so when the system is idle, like it is now, uh, the gas, uh, the nitrogen gas is actually turned off, but then this is opened up right here to air. So that air can actually go into the system if it needs to. And the reason for that is if there's actually a power failure or any other interlock um, system failure that causes the system to turn off, uh, the system automatically will vent itself. And if it vents itself and if the nitrogen is off, um, the, uh, the system will look for the, the, basically the path of least resistance. It's going to suck in air from wherever it can. And the place it's going to go to is the actual uh, mechanical pumps back here. So as it tries to vent itself and it has no air to vent itself with, it will pull the oil up. From the, uh, from the mechanical pumps, and you can see that as it pumps up, it will go into the actual turbo and completely destroy the turbo, uh, turbo pumps for both the main chamber and the load lock. So that's the reason why we vent to air, or we have it open to air when the system is idle. So that way, if that ever happens, it sucks in air and not oil from the turbo pumps. Okay. So that's a basic overview of the system. Um, right here we have the load lock transfer arm. That's the one thing I didn't uh, introduce, which is uh, basically a rail on magnets. And uh, that loads the sample in and out of the chamber. And then you have the uh, pressure gauge for the chamber. And uh, that's an overview uh, just for the system and the rack. Uh, there's nothing else really to it besides this. Um, there's the emergency power back there, which has like this Frankenstein switch. Uh, if you're ever in a pickle, you can pull that switch down and uh, it'll turn off all the power to the system. But you can also pick, uh, push this big red button right here, the emo button, emergency um, off switch. And uh, most engineering systems have an emo button um, so that way you can turn the system off if you're in a pickle and if it's trying to kill you. So. Uh, that said, let's go ahead and start uh, running a sample and we'll cover evaporation first and then we'll cover sputtering. And then as we open up the system, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll look at all the tiny parts of the uh, inside of the chamber and what you can change and what you can't change and how to do that. Okay.